Welcome to this uh, first webinar on uh, prader willi syndrome. The lecture is about uh, the multidisciplinary care and growth hormone treatment and how it can improve the health of children with prader willi syndrome. Uh, because it's the first uh, webinar on prader willi I thought maybe to, uh, to start with an overview of, uh, of what, uh, what are the characteristics of children with prader willi syndrome and also uh, give some data on the uh, multidisciplinary care and how we do it in the Netherlands, and then the long-term effects of growth hormone treatment, and then some conclusions. It's particularly important to start uh, also with the multidisciplinary care, because this is really the basis of the care for these children. First, I will uh, give you some data on the characteristics. Um, because maybe some of you are not so familiar with prader willi syndrome. Um, uh, this prader willi syndrome is uh, caused by uh, either a deletion or a uniparental disomy or an imprinting center mutation on the paternally inherited chromosome 15 in the so-called prader willi region, Q11 to 13. Uh, most children have the, uh, is due to a deletion or a, U, a UPD of 15. Imprinting center mutations are quite rare. The incidence of prader willi is low, uh, not extremely low, but low. Uh, it means one child uh, in 15,000 life-born infants. And most of the characteristics of these children are attributed to a hypothalamic dysfunction. So I personally believe that there is more than that in these children. Um, the, the characteristics of prader willi syndrome um, change over uh, time. So when they are born, they are severely hypotonic. Uh, they have feeding difficulties uh, due to that. And most children require tube feeding. Um, and you can see how they hang more or less when you take the child. Uh, when, when they are um, born, uh, they have actually uh, more, uh, and after uh, birth, they have a failure to thrive. Uh, it's the opposite of what, what people think about prader willi syndrome, uh, but they have already an abnormal body composition when they are born. They have very low lean body mass, we come back to that later on, and they have then more fat mass. And the boys, most boys, have undescended testes. So over the years, um, we have seen that the, the diagnosis of prader willi has improved in a way that it is now diagnosed at a much earlier age than before. And uh, at least in the Netherlands and also in some other countries, it's now the rule that when you have a hypotonia in a newborn child, this is prader willi syndrome, unless it is proven otherwise. When the children become older, the, the, the picture changes because the hypotonia will decrease. And at a certain age, mostly at three to four years, they will start to, to eat more and more and more. And then that is followed by uh, excessive appetites. And when food is not restricted, it will lead to morbid obesity, even in young children. Uh, the dysmorphic features of prader willi become more apparent with the almond-shaped eyes and also the tapered fingers and also the delayed psychomotor development, which becomes more obvious uh, at, over time compared to the healthy peers. Also, the neurobehavioral abnormalities will, will start to develop uh, the stubbornness, the, the rigidness, um, also that they tend to have tantrums when they become very angry and they can't speak or do anything anymore for, let's say, a few hours. Uh, also, scoliosis will develop. Uh, around 80% of the children have scoliosis from the age of 10 years. And they have a low growth velocity, which will lead to a short stature. Then when they become pubertal, the behavioral abnormalities become more and more apparent. Not in all children, because what we have learned over the years is that uh, children with prader willi syndrome and also people later on 
uh, with Prada really, they will have a wide variation in this phenotype. It's not that Prada really syndrome is, is this and this and this. There's a wide variation <clears throat> also in behavioral abnormalities. Some children will develop psychosis, um, but uh, nowadays less often uh, than, uh, than before, could be due to uh, our care, hopefully. Uh, and puberty is delayed, uh, incomplete, or it starts and then it stops, or it is even absent, and severe to morbid obesity when, it is, when food is not restricted. They, 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 need, they need a very strict reg regimen not to, not to get the food. And then uh, most of them will uh, become short adults. So actually, it, this is the picture over time. And that means that also the care has to change over time. Um, and that's important. Now we go to the multidisciplinary care. Um, this is difficult in some countries, I am aware, but uh, this gives what we think a kind of optimal setting. It would be good to have a, a, a central team with a pediatric endocrinologist because most children have um, a hormone disturbances is a nurse who takes care of parents and children and um, also parents to give them uh, uh, support a dietitian physical therapist and psychologist also uh, in the family setting um, um, in this this center group we have also what we call the prada really team consisting of the pediatric endocrinologist or a physician, doesn't matter so much, a nurse and a psychologist who, who can also visit patients at home or in, in another center. Um, because it's important that you have a good relationship between the, this, this Prada really team and, and also the, the parents, the families and the children, of course. And then around that, we have all the uh, other specialists the sleep specialist or the pediatric surgeon, the pediat general pediatrician also, also very important uh, for uh, just general pediatric issues, uh, clinical geneticists and so on. You can read it here. So in fact, these children come to the center, to the reference center, and they find there the, the, cent the team. And we then decide uh, who will be uh, visited uh, during the same a visit to the hospital uh, and parents can of course ask uh, in advance uh, that they need some uh, let's say um, some consultancy of a, of a pediatrician or a sleep specialist so it's um, in case you are able to do this this would be optimal we think um, so in the netherlands we have one reference center for prada really and we uh, purposely have uh, uh, organized it in a way that we have uh, Rotterdam, uh, this reference center in two locations, Rotterdam and Nijmegen. Rotterdam in the west and Nijmegen in the east part of the Netherlands. Children and their parents, they will visit uh, one to, once to twice per year, uh, depending on the age. And in addition, we have then the, what we call the treatment centers. We work closely together. The children are going there as well in between the, the visits to the reference center and the Prada Willi team will visit these centers. This is particular for the Netherlands because we are a relatively small country so we can travel there. Uh, it's an extra, uh, it's not always possible, uh, but that's how we try to do it. But the main thing is that you have a, a good collaboration and that's, and then I come to the next one, that together we, uh, we have performed, uh, developed a guideline on diagnostics and treatment uh, of children with Prada Willi. And also uh, we have a, a description of the healthcare network uh, for professionals and for parents where they can go if, for which disease and so on. So when you do it this way, it, it, it improves the care. That is our, uh, idea. Um, we have also information for parents, patients and caregivers, also for teachers, for instance, it's also important to, that they are updated, they understand what is Prada really, 
um, we have a, a binder for all the uh, parents that have a, that a child that's newly diagnosed. Uh, at, at this time, um, uh, it's mainly in, in, in babies, actually, or maybe one month or two months old. Um, so we have divided the binder in age groups, uh, the baby, uh, then the, the, the toddlers, the child, the pubertal children, and the young adults. Um, and, and we have age-related problems and solutions, practical issues uh, are discussed, um, legal issues, daycare options, special homes for the young adults with Kralewili. And uh, then we have a, there is a, that we did not develop that, but uh, the, um, it has been developed. A medical alert book and a behavioral alert book together with uh, patient organizations that are small books that parents uh, take with them uh, in their um, pocket. Uh, and that is also in the binder. Uh, so when they visit uh, a doctor, they can show it uh, to the doctor. Uh, we have translated them uh, the binder at this moment in French and English, and uh, we are working on Spanish and German and uh, in case you are interested, you can um, you can uh, contact uh, the, the email um, uh, the info kindandgroei.nl. Uh, um, we have also the information for parents, patients, and caregiver in a website. Uh, it's a, it's a special one. It's developed actually by the the, the patient organization. Uh, although we um, the um, uh, develop also content for this, uh, what is called the house of understanding. Um, there are chat, uh, chat functions, uh, the Facebook um, uh, functions, and also what to do in uh, um, uh, acute uh, life-threatening uh, uh, conditions. So this is a very important uh, site as well, and it, I think it would be good to have su such a thing. Because it's important um, not only for the children to have this multidisciplinary care, but that families are um, also involved and that they can find things, that they, that, that they are not uh, on their own. Because it's a rare disorder and there is always a tendency that you are alone. So it's important that, you, that, that, they, that, that people feel that we try to do it together to improve the health and quality of life for children and families. So at a certain moment, of course, children uh, become older. Fortunately, they, uh, they, they do. And then we, get, uh, we have, of course, the transition period. And then they go uh, together with the adult uh, endocrinologist. And in adulthood, uh, I'm not talking about this today because that's not my uh, uh, area. This is the area of the, end, uh, the, the adult endocrinologist and the team. It's, uh, they, they have more or less the same structure with the central core, the, this core uh, team, and then also the other um, uh, consultants uh, around. So what about the long-term effects of growth hormone? Because of course, multidisciplinary care has uh, done a lot and does a lot for the children. Uh, has really is really the basis of uh, of everything, uh, of improved care. But uh, we have uh, the the experience that, uh, to our surprise, growth hormone treatment um, has really changed these children. Um, and that's why I want to, to share with you our data. I'm fully aware that there are other data, there are other randomized control trials uh, in other countries, uh, but uh, because of the time restriction, I thought it may be good that I share our data with you, because I know these data very well. Um, of course, there are short-term data, but uh, uh, I think feel that uh, long-term data are very important because we need to know what the growth hormone does, not only on the short term, but also on the long term. So next slide, I will show you the data. And then I start with the randomized control trial, which was actually a short trial. Um, but this was the first trial in Prada Willi. 
in the 2000s, more than 20, around 20 years ago. And we had two trials, one in infants. At that, uh, at that stage, it was that we started growth month at the age of a half year to three years in infants, or in the prepubertal three, to, uh, three years to 12 to 14 years. And we had uh, uh, one group uh, uh, received growth hormone and the other group uh, received no growth hormone. So not placebo, but no growth hormone. And the same for the prepubertal ones. And in the infants, it was one year. And in the prepubertal children, it was two years. Uh, I'm not going into detail in, in, uh, 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 and show the results of this short-term uh, trial. Uh, but I want to share with you the longer ones, that long-term uh, results that um, were found after the, uh, the, the randomized control trial. Because nowadays we treat infants with Prada really from the age of around two months. Uh, it was uh, in 2000, it was daring that we started at six months, uh, but we have the impression that it, it would be good to start earlier. Uh, so when the parents have had the diagnosis at around one month of age, um, they, they, they have to get uh, uh, used to the fact that their child has prader willi syndrome, of course. And then we have the home visit with, by the prader willi uh, team. And uh, uh, everything will be explained. Uh, it can also, of course, be a, uh, during a visit in the hospital. Uh, but uh, around the age of two months and maybe three to four months, they will start growth hormone treatment. We give them this, uh, this what is called the standard dose for Prader-Willi syndrome. But in the first month, we give half of the dose uh, because we have the experience that when you immediately start with this dose in young children, they will uh, retain water, the, so uh, they will become more heavy. Um, it's very clear. So we start, we do, we increase the, the dosage in the first month. Nowadays, we have around 230 uh, uh, people that children that are treated. It means in the Netherlands that we have almost all the children uh, in, in the, in our, under our care. Um, uh, there are questions regarding the long-term growth mode treatments. Um, for instance, is it able to counteract the natural history of increasing obesity in Prada Willi? Is it also able to uh, change other characteristics like the, the, the behavior or the cognitive functioning? Uh, and is long-term growth hormone treatment safe? So for the long-term growth hormone, uh, we had data on 80 years of growth hormone. Uh, we were able to ha have 60 children with prader willi syndrome with confirmed diagnosis, treated for uh, eight years, naive for, for growth hormone treatment at start, and they were prepubertal at start. There are, these are relatively older data, but I want to share that with you. We measured a lot, as you can see, also body composition by DEXA scanning, bone age and also uh, fasting blood samples. And this slide shows you the, the baseline characteristics of the 60 children. Uh, we can see here that there are around um, uh, 55 males and 45 females, that there are 50% uh, had a deletion, around 37% had a UPD and 10% ICD of translocation. Uh, the age at start of these eight years of growth hormone treatment was five and a half years. Uh, you see that at the age of five and a half years, they are already on average above the 2SD for fat percentage. And the lean body mass is low, is also below the 2SD. And also height is, is short, they are short, below the minus 2SD. So this slide shows you the fat percentage over eight years. Uh, here is, are the years of growth hormone treatments. Uh, the data are presented as an SD score. 
So zero is the, the median of the normal range and the minus two, the lower end and the plus two, the upper end. And as, as I just presented, their fat percentage SG is already uh, at the start above the two. The first year there is a reduction, but then they start to gradually going up. Uh, but this growth hormone, we are able to, to keep them more or less just above the two SG. It's not only us, it's also in other countries. The lean body mass uh, is below the minus two SG. Uh, is going significantly up into the normal range and then remains more or less stable, although here is a little bit less than at two years, but it is still significantly higher than at the start. Then when you look at the BMI SD compared to Dutch healthy children, it's, a, uh, it's, uh, it's more or less around the one SDS. And then uh, when you uh, compare this with the SD score of the, 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 help, the reference for Prada Willy, the BMI SDS is around minus one. So it seems that this is quite a stable condition with growth among uh, treatments. Height SD increased significantly from below minus two to zero SDS. Uh, although some children, there are exceptions, some children do not reach the uh, above the minus two SD, but on average, this, in this group, they are around zero SD, although this is not the aim of the treatment. Uh, IGF-1, serum IGF-1, SDS is low at the start, as you can see, minus two, and it rises uh, immediately uh, to above to SD. And this is one of the issues that is still uh, there. Also, not only with us, it's uh, everywhere that when you give these children growth among treatment, you need relatively, uh, you have high um, IGF-1 levels. Uh, you, have, you really have to keep an eye on it. Otherwise, they will rise uh, to above 3 SD, and that's not what we, we feel that's correct. On the other hand, when you lower the GH dose too much, you will lose the effect because then they start to increase fat mass again and lose lean body mass. So it's it's how it's just a, a matter of looking very well at at um, IGF-1 SD. On the other hand, to see that you don't uh, reduce growth hormone treatment too much. We know, and I will come to that later on that uh, the IGF bioactivity is not so high, it's not above the 2-SD. So there is a discre discrepancy between the bioactivity and the immunoreactive uh, IGF-1 SD. Uh, this slide, some of you might have seen this uh, previously, shows very well the effect of growth hormone, although this is of course not a randomized control trial, uh, but this boy is very proud to show how he has changed. At the start, he was three years old, and you can see he has already fat uh, upper legs and also his abdomen. Uh, then after one year of growth hormone, this has changed already. And five years, you see, he, he, he remains more or less at the, with the same condition, uh, and also eight years. Of course, we as pediatricians, we see that he has still too much fat, a relatively low lean body mass. But anyhow, he looks completely different from many uh, children with prader willi syndrome previously who were at that moment already quite obese. Um, of course, there are also other issues um, that might be important uh, during growth hormone treatment. Um, we know that the, uh, the children with Prada Willi have a mild um, cognitive dysfunction. It's not severely, but it's uh, mild to moderate. And also the, the, the young children have uh, delays in psychomotor development. So what we performed, we performed a study. First, a randomized control trial. I will not show that, but in that study we found in the infants and toddlers 
then is um, children um, um, improved with growth hormone treatment, particularly the motor development improved. But then we wanted to know whether uh, this um, was maintained during three years of growth hormone. So we had 30, uh, 63 infants and toddlers with Prada Willi who started uh, growth hormone at the age of one. Um, and we performed there the B BSID2 uh, to see uh, what growth hormone did to their uh, motor and mental development. So this is the BSID, it uh, results in a mental scale and also a motor scale. And uh, the data are presented as a uh, percent of the expected psychomotor development for age. So 100% is in healthy children. So we, we then see whether they have 100% or how much less. So for instance, whether they have a, a motor development of 70 or 60% compared to healthy children. This shows the psychomotor development during the three years with the BSID. You can't do more than three years because then you have to go to another test. Here on the left side, we see mental development during the three years. Three years, mental development and the motor development on the right side. There's clearly a significant increase of, on the mean and uh, values. And, um, uh, it uh, increases significantly during the three years. Uh, the development increased mental score from 58% to 80, and the motor score from 42% at the start to 78. So 80% is not yet completely normal, of course. But the disparity between the children with Prada Willi and healthy references decreased. Um, and uh, we know from the previous study that uh, when you do not treat, they remain at the same level. Uh, so we feel that this is a positive effect of growth hormone for the young children. And we found also that there is more increase in psychomotor development when the children were younger at the start of growth hormone, and also when they were more delayed in psychomotor development at the start of growth hormone. So those who were more severe had more benefit of the growth hormone than those who were already high at a relatively good level. Of course, it is also important to see whether uh, the growth hormone can um, increase uh, the, the, the cognitive function, yes or no, in, in older children. Uh, then uh, this slide shows you the, the, the randomized control trial in the, in the children, the prepubertal children, 6 to 12 years, with the growth hormone in one group half and the other one untreated for two years. And uh, this is also, uh, these are relatively older data in 50 children with Prada Willi, also with the WISC test. And I show this because you need to know what happens when you do not give growth hormone. Otherwise, you can't um, review the data of the eight year growth hormone. So in this, uh, in this study, we could see the following. We had three uh, tests, a subtest. This is the similarity. It means that this is the abstract verbal reasoning. The block design gives an in information about the mathematical part of your uh, cognition. It's the visual spatial skill is officially called. And the vocabulary is your verbal um, um, IQ. And then it gives a total IQ based on the subtests. In red is the growth mode treated group, and uh, in gray, the untreated group. And from this, you can see that the, the ones with growth mode treatment are more or less at the same level. The scores are, are in SD. So it means that when you have a horizontal line that you are uh, developing in this, at the same pace, as healthy children. So although they are maybe not that high, for instance, block design is below minus two, it means that they 
they remain at the same level. Uh, so, but you see the gray lines tend to in the decrease over the two years, and particularly similarities in vocabulary, we see that they that there's a significant inc a difference between the two groups after two years. So yes, cognitive functioning uh, developed during growth more at the same pace as in healthy references, but it deteriorated in the untreated group. Then the aim of the eight-year study. We investigated the longitudinal effects of eight years of growth hormone on the cognitive functioning. And uh, we also wanted to know whether starting growth hormone before the age of two years would result in a better cognitive functioning after eight years than starting during childhood. So we had what, two, two, two sub-studies, uh, longitudinal study during eight years, in 43 children. These children were quite old when we started. As you can see, they were around eight years, from six to 11 and a half. Because this score, can you, you can, this test you can only perform from the age of six. Um, Cross-sectional study then, at after eight years, because we wanted to compare the 43, uh, above the age of six with the 22, who started before uh, two years. And we could not have longitudinal data of the, the, the ones that started in infancy because um, you can't have a risk test uh, before the age of six years. So what we performed, we did a risk test after eight years of prothermal treatment, and then we compared the two groups. So this slide shows you that um, this, um, this visual spatial scales, the mathematical part, tends to increase over eight years compared, uh, is an, again, an SD score compared to healthy, healthy children. So this is relatively, it's, no, it's quite good. It's not significant, but that's of course not what we would expect in a, a child with a syndrome. But it means that at least it, it, it is the same over the years. And from below minus two to in the normal range. Then the similarities, it's in the normal range and it stays there. And the same applies to the, the verbal score. It's also low normal, but it is stable. And the estimated total IQ is also stable over eight years. So it means, again, that the cognitive functioning progresses at the same pace as the healthy references during these eight years of growth hormone and does not deteriorate. This is what we, we feel, this, I feel, is this is positive um, outcome. Uh, there's no further uh, uh, deterioration when you give growth hormone. Of course, uh, we wanted to know this, uh, whether there is a difference whether you start before the age of two years or after six. And in blue, you see the ones that started before two years. And the verbal, the verbal score was, um, was, is indeed significantly higher. The other ones tend to be higher, but not significantly. And the total IQ is also uh, somewhat higher. It's not very much higher, but it is just significantly higher. So it seems that when you start growth among before the age of two years, this is might be more beneficial than to do it later on, although also those who started later on had the benefit. Um, that are the conclusions. So cognitive uh, development uh, progresses at the same rate as in healthy references uh, and does not deteriorate during the eight years. And when you start it during infancy, it seems to be more beneficial, maybe because you give it then in this what we call the critical period of narrow development. But there are of, are of course uh, safety problems, maybe, question. Uh, scoliosis, we know that uh, children with Prada really have scoliosis. Um, we uh, performed a study uh, and found that 80% of the children um, um, from at 10, age 10 years and older have scoliosis. 
And we also found that uh, there were no negative effects of growth hormone on onset and progression of scoliosis. And later on, also others have found the same. So it seems that growth hormone is not a contraindication when you have scoliosis or when you do not have scoliosis and are afraid um, that it will develop. Uh, what about sleep disordered breathing? We know that uh, children have apnea during the, during the night. Uh, you can uh, test this with the polysomnography. I'm not going to uh, in too uh, much detail, uh, but uh, just uh, summarize that sleep disordered breathing is prevalent in Pradavili. Uh, on average, they stop breathing five times per hour. Uh, but to our surprise, it was not so much obstructive apnea, it's mainly central apnea. Uh, on the other hand, it's maybe not so surprising because children uh, with Prada Willi, um, uh, of, of uh, mice with, pra with Prada Willi syndrome, with a lesion in the Prada Willi region, they miss uh, the, um, uh, the, the neck din gene. And when they have that, when they miss that, and it's the same more or less deletion as it in the children, uh, they have problems with breathing. So maybe it's due to that. Uh, so it's important to screen for sleep disordered breathing also before you start growth hormone treatment or anyhow in these children. We know from our data that growth hormone treatment does not increase the number of apnea. That we, we are not afraid of that anymore. Uh, but obstructive apnea can increase during respiratory infections. And this is something to, to remember. So particularly the young ones, when they have uh, upper respiratory uh, infection, they cannot breathe very well. And then they have this obstructive apnea. And we have several polysomnographies during this uh, respiratory infection showing that in some children that uh, it, uh, apnea can increase to 38 times per hour, which is really a risk maybe for being in danger during the night. Uh, so we also uh, advise to consult an ENT specialist in case of snoring or uh, signs of uh, obstructive apnea and to have a low threshold adenotonsillectomy in these children. I'm not in favor to do this in normally in children, but for Prada really it's better because they have this floppy throat. And when there is a little bit enlargement of the tonsils, it, they can come into problems during the night. Then adrenal insufficiency. I'm not going into detail here as well, but uh, the cause of that in, in children is often unknown. Uh, and it's often during mild or moderate upper respiratory infection. So we, I mean, know already that there is more uh, central apnea uh, and obstructive apnea, but that can maybe not only explain why they die uh, during the night, mostly during the night. And uh, so when one child, unfortunately, a long time ago, and uh, until now, the only one in our group uh, died. Um, we found that he had a very low cortisol level uh, within an hour after his death. So we performed a, a metirapon test in a group of 25 children with Prada Willi, and we found an incidence of central adrenal insufficiency in 60%. Uh, after that publication, we, there were several other studies published uh, not showing such a high percentage. Uh, most often uh, do after uh, an ACTH test, which is, in my opinion, not the best test to, to test for central uh, adrenal insufficiency. Uh, and also there is a publication that in adults, uh, they could not bind it with a major upon test. So we need really more research in this field. It's my very strong opinion based on our experience that it is important to give hydrocortisone stress medication in case of surgery, because we know that uh, we have less problems and no problems anymore during surgery and anesthesia. 
And you can even consider it when they have a, a fever or severe stress to give it. Uh, so, but this is the, it's not the end of the story. But I, I'm, I'm personally, I think you can better give it. Um, and uh, of course, there are threats that people try to give it too much, but it's not our experience that parents do that. They know it, you have to explain it. And I prefer to give it instead not to give it and have a, pro a child in problems. So safety, I'm almost at the end of uh, the presentation. Uh, safety during the long term, growth hormone treatment, um, other issues, no change in blood pressure, no deterioration of the glucose metabolism. Normal, we had found a normal bone maturation, normal bone mineral density. Also improvement of the total and LDL cholesterol. The main issue at the moment still is the high, relatively high, no, not the high IGF-1 levels. What to do with it? Does it give a long-term risk? Um, on the other hand, you want them to have a normal body, a relatively normal body composition, and you lower the GH levels, uh, the GH dose, you get problems. Then we know that they have a normal IGF-1, igf 3 ratio, and we also uh, tested IGF bioactivity, which was normal in some children that very, have very high IGF-1 levels. So what to do with this? this is again, not the end of the story. Uh, regarding adverse events and serious adverse events, we found a serious drop in a serious adverse events since we have started the hydrocortisone treatment during stress. Um, then we come to some conclusions uh, regarding growth hormone treatment, uh, long-term growth hormone treatment in combination with diet and exercise has really changed the phenotype and the health of the father and children in a positive way due to significant improvement of their body composition uh, less body fat, more lean body mass, uh, also in, uh, improvement of motor and mental development and maintenance uh, improvement and the maintenance of cognitive functioning, um, less behavioral problems and food seeking. I did not show these data. Uh, it's not uh, severely uh, reduced, but uh, it remains. Certainly, but we feel that uh, we have the impression that it is less, a bit less than before, and there is an improvement of height, SD and uh, SDS and head circumference. So the long-term safety uh, is also reassuring, but uh, what I said is that we need special attention to the relatively high IGF-1 uh, levels. So nowadays. A child with prader willi syndrome is quite different compared to uh, previously. And that's due to we, what we feel early diagnosis has much improved in many countries. There's much more uh, knowledge about prader willi and the changes over time and how to handle this. It's uh, when you have multidisciplinary care, centralized care, it, it also improves them. Uh, the diet and the exercise, and also early growth hormone treatment. Of course, we have now uh, also tried other treatments because uh, this is still a child with prader willi syndrome. It's not a normal child in, a, in that way. There are still um, behavioral problems, the tendency of uh, trying to find food, um, and you have to, to, to take care of them the entire day, more or less. It's, it's really a burden for many parents. Um, so it's not that we have completely normalized uh, it, but it has improved. And uh, children are not so hyperphagic anymore. They do quite well and they are not so obese. So um, we need more treatment. Uh, of course, there are trials with uh, all kinds of uh, medication to, 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 to fight uh, particularly the hyperphagia and uh, behavioral problems. But uh, I think it's too much for now to go into detail. 
and I think I'd like to end this one to say that I think that we have now a new generation of children with Stadewilli syndrome. Although we are not yet optimal, it is much better than before. And I hope that um, I've given you some more information about this during this. Um, what is the mechanism behind the improve, improved mental score after three years of treatment? Is it because of an improved motor score of children or does the growth hormone have an effect on brain neuron development? Um, yeah, this is, it, I think it's a very good question. Uh, and actually the answer is not so easy because um, it's our uh, idea that it is maybe both. Of course, when you when a child improves in motor development, you can imagine that instead instead of just um, sitting uh, or uh, being on the abdomen, is less um, uh, activating the child. Let's say in, in the, to explore the environment. So when the motor development improves, the child can maybe walk and go to things and he starts to learn about his environment much more than when the motor development is so much delayed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have also found that growth hormone treatment in, um, improves the cognitive uh, development of children that are born small for gestational age. Uh, so uh, it could well be that uh, at a certain age, and that's why we looked at the early, uh, the children at an early age, that, uh, that there is some improvement uh, of, of uh, uh, certain centers in the brain, because uh, we know that growth among receptors are all over the brain. So it's not excluded, but it is very difficult, of course, to prove. So it's probably a combination. Thank you for a very nice presentation. Thank you for a very nice presentation on this uh, very interesting subject. Uh, I'm a pediatric endocrinologist in Copenhagen and I see uh, more than half of the Danish patients with uh, prader willi syndrome. And I do agree that uh, it certainly has uh, changed a lot since we started growth hormone very early on these uh, patients. Um, I would like to address the issue about IGF-1 levels because uh, I think that's a huge problem. Um, it's uh, a larger problem than in uh, the small for gestational age uh, patients where we also see very high IGF-1 levels uh, sometimes. Uh, we've done a study like your bioactivity study, we did one in SDA children as well and found the same thing that the bioactive IGF-1 was lower in the SDA children than the elevated uh, IGF-1, total IGF-1 levels. So I was wondering two things. Uh, did you look at the insulin sensitivity and was there a relation to the high IGF-1 levels in these children who uh, maybe had a, a lower insulin sensitivity? And, and also, how do you manage uh, this problem with the IGF-1 levels uh, on a daily basis? Do you use an algorithm or do you just um, look at the levels and then uh, turn the uh, growth hormone dose a little bit down or up? Or what do you do? Yes, well, the, to start with your the last question, um, yeah, it's just a pragmatic approach, um, and we have discussed this also with other um, uh, experts, um, mainly with uh, also from Sweden actually, and, and German and Germany and UK and, and uh, Toulouse, uh, uh, Maite Talbert, uh, because we all this already quite some time ago. Uh, and because we all face the same problem. And, and then it's also in the guideline, we felt that we have to accept uh, IGF-1 levels uh, up to 3 SD. So as long as they are not above the 3 SD, we accept. Of course, this is not uh, based on any evidence. Uh, the only thing is that we were happy to find that the bioactivity was lower, also in the ones that were above the 3 SD. But we do not dare to, to, to give growth hormone with IGF-1 levels above 3 SD uh, for many years. We feel that that's not correct. 
On the other hand, when you go, let's say, within the normal range, you lose the effect of growth hormone. So there is a discre this discrepancy. So I think it's better to, uh, to what we, in practice, we try to have them at around two, two and a half SD. Um, and it's also the, uh, we have also the experience that it is uh, sometimes due to the reference values because we have pro particularly problems in the very young children and in the pu uh, pubertal children. And it is also due to the spline uh, through the reference data when, because when you get from the lab the SD score, uh, you, uh, depends very much how they have done the, the spline through the, the, the normal data. And uh, there, there's a tendency to have low IGF-1 levels uh, in reference data uh, in, the, in the young ones and also uh, during after, of just after puberty. And when you have late puberty, then of course you will immediately have a high IGF-1 level like you have in, in, the, in the father really children. So we, 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 yeah, it's just a pragmatic, it's around two, two, two and a half SD in practice. And regarding the insulin sensitivity, uh, it's a long time ago that we have uh, looked at that. Um, I think it's 2007 or something like that. Uh, we could not find a relation in Prada really. Uh, we found one in uh, SDA, short SDA children, but not in Prada really. I don't know, what is your experience? Are you so, well, what, yes, what I'm still here. Find? So, so I was I, I was part of the NESCA study, the North European SDA study, mm -hmm. and uh, we did a, a randomized control trial where we tried to IGF-1 titrate these uh, children mm -hmm. uh, with the SDA, and actually we found that uh, uh, turning down the GH dose just it's, uh, they stopped growing, and and the IGF-1 levels were once they had reached the very high levels, they just kept on the on the high levels and and reducing the growth hormone uh, dose didn't change that much. So some of the children were almost put uh, or taken off growth hormone uh, during the year, uh, two years where we titrated the dose. Uh, yeah. So I, yeah. I agree with you that we, we, we will have to accept some uh, elevated uh, total IGF-1 levels and uh, maybe uh, in the future we will titrate the dose on bioactive IGF-1 instead of uh, uh, the total yes. IGF-1. Yes, hopefully, yes. <laughs> but the, the bioactivity, to measure bioactivity is quite a, a, an undertaking, to be honest. <laughs> it's not so easy. It's very no, time I know. Yeah, as you know, probably, yes. So it's not a, a routine measurement, what you can just uh, do until now, at least. Yeah. What do you advise your patients or families to do in case of mild, moderate, upper uh, respiratory infection? Yeah, another very good question, I think. Um, what we, we in, have instructed all the parents uh, that in case of that, they have to go to the, pediat to the hospital, to the pediatrician, to get an... an, um, an and then we have in, um, advised the pediatricians to have a low threshold um, admission uh, with a monitor. Um, of course, when it is just a little bit, because that happens, of course, also in these children, then it's not necessary. But when they are really have this obstructed nose, then I think you should not take a risk to keep them at home. I think it's better to go to the, to the hospital and um, have them on the monitor. And of course, then all the general care of the upper respiratory infection with nose drops and so on. Uh, and you have to take more care of these children than in uh, healthy children. Okay, next question, uh, Anita from Goodman or Johansson. Uh, would you consider the uh, growth hormone treatment to be a replacement therapy or a pharmacological treatment to achieve changes in body composition? Um, I, I think what we, um, I think Prada really um, is, I think all these, all the patients, particularly the children, have growth hormone deficiency, uh, functional growth hormone deficiency. 
uh, they have low IGF-1 levels, they have, tend to have low IGF-3 levels, uh, their whole body composition, everything uh, directs to a growth hormone deficiency. Uh, so from that perspective, I think we just uh, give them um, uh, the growth hormone as, a, as an addition, or not an addition, but just um, um, to take care of the growth hormone deficiency. Yeah, I do, uh, it's not the same as uh, in the short SDA children where you give uh, high doses while, while these children have no growth hormone deficiency. But, but uh, we performed growth hormone tests, the, uh, the, uh, the RG9 uh, tolerance test uh, plus the GHRH test uh, when the children uh, had reached adult height. And then we found uh, in testing no growth hormone deficiency. And uh, we were very surprised because actually we, 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 uh, we thought that they would be growth hormone deficient, all of them. But it could be, of course, due to the test, the type of test, that, uh, that it is just at the level where they still have a normal function of the, the, the GH axis. Uh, or it is uh, that they that it changes over time, and maybe it's even due to the growth hormone treatment that you get a more uh, development of the the, the 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 cells in the the hypothalamus and the and the, the pituitary. So uh, to our surprise, most of them were not uh, severely growth hormone deficient as an adult, uh, but I, I'm sure that uh, they are growth hormone deficient. In, um, and, and not only as a child, but also the young adults. Everything uh, what they show is growth hormone deficiency. And they improve a lot, this growth hormone. And I hope I can <laughs> have answered this question. So they uh, need, thank you. I think it's very important. I want to say that this is, this is a, a webinar about uh, growth hormone and, and care for children. But we have also data on the young adults, the young adults uh, with the placebo-controlled uh, trials and the longer-term trials, and it's very, very clear that also adults need growth hormone to 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 stay in a healthy condition. Um, I'm I'm more than convinced about it, and that's probably because they are growth hormone deficient. Uh, Prader-Willi syndrome is associated with multiple hypothalamic pituitary axis abnormalities affecting growth and adrenals and possible gonadal. Does growth hormone treatment decrease the incidence of difficulties to the adrenal insufficiency and description or disorder, I think? Disorder puberty. Um, yeah, I did not show that, but uh, maybe for next webinar or, um, we can do that. Uh, we have also data of growth hormone, uh, the, the effect of growth hormone on uh, puberty. Uh, and um, we are working on growth hormone and adrenal function. And up till now, there is no reason to believe that growth hormone has a negative effect at all actually on puberty and pubertal development um, we had um, uh, as, as a conclusion that there is an it, it's not a significant but there is a tendency to better uh, pubertal development in children with family okay thank you i have two more questions and then we will wrap it up for to today uh, a question for from roberta when you say that growth hormone do not increase the risk of apnea, do you refer to obstructive apnea? In this case, if a child has an obstructive apnea, don't you reduce the growth hormone doses? Um, we, we could not, I think the best would be to, to find the paper in PubMed. Uh, but uh, to, then you can read it, but we did not find uh, many obstructive um, uh, apnea, uh, mainly central apnea, and there was no effect of growth hormone, and we have done this twice, 
in two studies on uh, the central and the obstructive apnea. On the other hand, when a child has severe obstructive apnea, we, we do not start growth hormone. Then we first want to make sure that this child uh, has, is going to the ENT surgeon uh, to and have a low threshold um, a tonsillectomy or adeno, uh, adenolectomy. <laughs> Um, and um, because we want to make sure that we have a large um, uh, airway, larger airway during growth hormone treatment. It's not that growth hormone treatment increases tonsils. That has been a, a problem or an, an idea in the beginning of growth hormone treatment, but that, that we, we are sure that that does not happen. Uh, but some children uh, at the age of uh, non also healthy children uh, increase tonsils at the age of three to five years. So it's important that in the children with Prada really that does not happen because of their the, the, the floppy uh, throat and the pharynx. Um, so when the child has severe obstructive apnea, uh, I think you should, should take care that uh, that the airway is a bit improves, and maybe not to stop growth hormone because I'm not sure that that will improve the situation. Uh, Anita, I think the last question um, is from Francesco. I wonder how you measure the insulin sensitivity in these children before and during the growth hormone treatment. Children with Prader-Willi syndrome could potentially have an increased risk of T2D. Therefore, is it very important to measure insulin sensitivity accurately before and after the growth hormone treatment? Yes, um, I agree. Um, it's, 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 I, I think you meant, mean uh, the diabetes type 2. Uh, in, in the young children, we do not have that, uh, but in the, the young adults, um, there, is a, there are some, child, some people that have um, imp impaired uh, glucose tolerance. Uh, but we have actually a, a, a recent publication on that, that, are, uh, that uh, there is no um, versioning of, uh, of the glucose uh, metabolism uh, during growth hormone treatment, also not on the long term. And also not compared to placebo, uh, but we have per performed that in the young adults, not so much in the young, very young children. We know in the very young children we have uh, done this with uh, glucose uh, versus insulin uh, um, levels and also adiponectin levels. Um, but the, we, we, the, this this problem of the diabetes uh, becomes more when the children become older and particularly in the older ones we have done these studies so it's easy to to find the publications i think well thank you very much for um for um participating in this webinar uh, in case you have more uh, questions please uh, um, send them to the um, the endo uh, ern uh, office uh, and they will forward that to me and maybe I can then answer some of the questions. But of course, there are still many um, things uh, not completely uh, sure. Uh, so it, it's very important that we continue our investigations and also the care for the children. So thank you very much for being present.